Okay. Now, uh, I'm sure you've got uh, different answers from the, the ones that, that I have, but I think if I was going to talk about to several of the evangelical churches that are really quite close to us uh, at the college, and I think I'd probably say to some extent uh, we within the college would be typical of this as well, uh, I'd say that the, the, the problems that are really besetting would be the sense of entitlement on everybody's behalf uh, and also the sense of suspicion. That uh, that makes it very, very difficult uh, even to accept somebody else's service because actually you're constantly saying what's in it for them. There's no such thing as a free lunch uh, and, and, and so on. Now, the, the reason why we've gone into this at, at, at such length, as I say, uh, is because if we're going to, to, to think about the impact of the Trinity uh, on servant leadership, on servant leadership and servant fellowship, we have to be aware of the kind of things that are propelling us away from the biblical ideal, as well as uh, the, the way that the, the Trinity is profoundly countercultural uh, in the way that it would move us on these particular areas. So page four, uh, at this point, I want to start a Christian evaluation uh, of uh, how we should regard the things that we've just been talking about. Here, uh, I want to uh, bring up in particular uh, Augustine uh, and the City of God, uh, his uh, famous book, uh, kind of written over a number of years uh, after Rome was sacked uh, by the barbarians around about 410, uh, and the kind of uh, shock that that was for Augustine's world. Now, the issues that Augustine characteristically starts to deal with in his theology uh, in, around this, this time are to do with pride, exploitation, envy, rebellion. And these are things that have been kind of perennial presence throughout Christian theology uh, since the, well, since uh, Genesis onwards. But in particular, uh, they're articulated by Augustine, I think, in, in our particular uh, uh, neck of the woods. And he writes this. We see then that the two cities, and he's talking about two ways of life, two kinds of uh, organizations that humans tend to have. So think ways of life when we talk about the two cities. We see then that the two cities were created by two kinds of love. The earthly city was created by self-love, reaching the point of contempt for God. The heavenly city, by the love of God, carried as far as contempt of self. In fact, the earthly city glories in itself, the heavenly city glories in the Lord. The former looks for glory from men, the latter finds its highest glory in God, the witness of a good conscience. The earthly lifts up its head in its own glory. The heavenly city says to its God, my glory, you lift up my head. In the former, the lust for domination lords it over its princes as over the nations it subjugates. In the other, both those put in authority and those subject to them serve one another in love. The rulers by their counsel, the subjects by obedience. The one city loves its own strength shown in its powerful leaders. The other says to its God, I will love you, my Lord, my strength. And it's absolutely critical at this point to, to grasp that there is love in the earthly city. The trouble is... It's a parody of real love, isn't it? Love's there in the earthly city, but who does the love look at? Who's it directed to? Well, in terms of pride, in terms of glory and all the rest of it, it's internally directed, isn't it? It's a love of self. It's not a love of the other. And let me introduce at this point a term that we'll be coming back to over the next couple of days. It is a private love. It's a love turned in. So one of the phrases that both Augustine and Luther uh, use for, for human beings in their natural state after the fall is that we are curved in on ourselves. We are like ingrowing toenails in ourselves. We have curved in. And what should be directed outwards has been directed inwards. What should be given to another is given to ourselves. It's a private love. And it is a parody of real love, which looks to the other. That's Augustine's fundamental perspective. And of course, when you put it like that, you find yourself thinking, boy, does that draw together all the things that we've just been looking at uh, in terms of entitlement, uh, suspicion, and, and so on and so on. 
so much of it is internally directed, self-incurved, incurvatus in se, to use the Latin phrase for, for, for this. Uh, I read uh, this book 14 excerpt, uh, and every time I come to it, I find myself thinking, this is horribly accurate, don't you? Horribly accurate. So look at it. The lust for domination lords it over its princes as over the nations it subjugates. You know, you may think you're a lord uh, and that you're lording it over other people, but actually your own appetites for power and for domination are overcoming you as you do it. You're not in control of yourself because your lusts control you. You've become a tyrant to yourself. That kind of thought. And then look at the almost shattering statement of what a human society is like when it's got other person love. Those subject to them serve one another in love. The rulers by their counsel, the subjects by obedience. How does that sound in a current Western culture to say that you love someone by obeying them? It, it's not comfortable, is it, in a, in a Western culture at the moment to say that? Now let's look, just as we close, uh, at the baptism of the Lord Jesus. The reason why we're going here, Matthew 3, 13, 17, is that this is actually one of Augustine's favorite passages for uh, working out uh, what is, 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 as it were, typical about the relationships of the Trinity. So having spent all this time thinking about these things, having diagnosed it uh, in terms of the two loves that Augustine talks about, uh, we're now thinking about, well, what is it about the Trinity that is so odd compared to the culture in which we are, are set? Why is it that it's so countercultural? So the baptism of Jesus, Matthew 3, 13, to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And the reason that Augustine found this such a fascinating passage uh, is really the three bullet points that I've got down on the handout on page five. First of all, you've got all three persons of the Trinity on deck, as it were, at the same time. So you, you can't say, uh, as it were, that it's one character playing all three of them. That's just not a, not a runner. It's not that there's one God who appears first as Father, then as Son, and sometimes as the Holy Spirit. All three on deck at the same time. What's more, they are asymmetric. And by that I mean, uh, it's not just that they are different as individuals, but they are doing different things, characteristically different things. There's a unity about it, and the way that Augustine loves to talk about this is to say that one person of the Trinity does not do what he does without the others, not without, but actually they are all doing different things. It's Jesus who's baptized, not the Father or the Spirit. It's the Spirit who descends as, uh, in the likeness of a dove, not the Father or the Son. It's the Father who says, this is my Son, and not the Son or the Spirit. They all do their own thing, but not without each other. There is a unity there. They are genuinely different. And therefore, one of the things you notice here is that while all three are God, equally divine, they're not the same. In that kind of sense of sameness, perceptibly different from the way that our culture tends to approach these things. Lastly, of course, they are all looking outwards, beyond themselves. What is the Father trying to do here? Well, what the Father is trying to do is point to his Son. He's trying to say, look, this is the one I love. 
What's the spirit trying to do? He's trying to help the father do that. Point to his son, designate. What is the son trying to do? The son is submitting to his father for the purposes of the salvation of the human race. They're all looking to the others, working together with this one purpose. So of the earthly city love or the heavenly city love, which kind of love are we seeing here? We're seeing heavenly city love, aren't we? Because we're seeing other-personed love. And it's at that moment, as you look at those things of asymmetric, other-personed, that you start to see, yes, the Trinity is countercultural, And that therefore, looking at the Trinity will have something to teach us uh, about the patterns of servanthood uh, that we've identified. Let's just pause there, uh, because it's time for coffee. Uh, Mark is looking anxious, uh, and I'm parched. <laughs>